so nice to see everybody here. Welcome. So it's always weird to be the introducer because you kind of feel like an awkward frame around what's about to happen, as though I'm dictating the context, but I want to make sure you know that that's absolutely untrue. I tried to find a way to introduce Colleen that did not use the words badass, <laughs> but I just used it. She's badass. Yeah. I agree. Her straightforward attitude has earned her so much respect in art and academic circles alike. She's exhibited all over the place, internationally, nationally, places like the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Three Walls, you name it. Her work has notations of African American history, Afrofuturism, but it's all spun together in this really empathetic fashion that plays with signs, signifiers, and the signified, or maybe more simply put, plays with our perception of what's happening. When I think of your work, I think of, I wrote it down so I would remember. <laughs> poetic haunting, but necessary disturbances in the hegemonic systems of iconography and narrative. Can you just write that down and then I'm just going to reproduce that. But I think it's so exciting that you're here now that we as Landmark are starting our four-year Bachelor of Arts program because Colleen's work touches on so many different aspects and with this interdisciplinary hope that we have, it's so exciting to see all of you in the audience coming from such different fields here to witness this. So I'm going to shut up because I'd rather let you speak for yourself. Thanks. Thank Welcome. you. Hi everyone, um, it's such an honor to be here at Landmark. I want to thank uh, Umberto and, and Jin for, I guess, massaging the way to get me here and thank everyone else, uh, Jeff and Christina and there's other people that um, I've been in contact with, uh, Leslie's class today, that have welcomed me and made sure I got here. So thanks everybody. Um, I, I must confess that the title of this talk, I, I gave it uh, to Jeff about four months ago and then pretty much forgot all about it. Um, but I think I gave him that title because it's at the foundations of what I actually do. Um, uh, or the way I would describe the process by which I make things. Um, and um, so I'm really glad that I, that is the title. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to talk about Afrofuturism, but mo more sort of like as a conceptual framework, uh, the way that different tactics and strategies are deployed um, uh, to make work. And I, I know that um, here we are in an academic institution, and academic institutions all over the country, all over the world, are, have, um, have, have um, declared a great interest in this idea of Afrofuturism. Um, <clears throat> um, and um, I'm not sure that the, the, the label is actually um, one that uh, is so easily attached to things. But I, I'm, I, I found it really useful to me as a way of, of locating my work, uh, so I'm willing to talk about it. But uh, I offer you this image as an invitation. It sort of is the beginning of a way to talk about my work. This is um, uh, two sheets of uh, porcelain with um, black underglaze, and the text is written on with um, uh, acrylic paint. Um, <clears throat> craft. So a lot of the things that I use in my films or things that I intend to use, uh, they get made. And this object is uh, one of the things that I was making while thinking about how to make a film. thought maybe it would end up in a narrative in some way, but it didn't. It, 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 it just remained as an object itself. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, the Trump oil effect is an attempt to sort of um, get at a certain kind of archaeological veracity of uh, this object, these pieces sheets of paper, but to make them eternal. Um, one of the ways that I work is to um, uh, well, I, this work is surrounding Sun Ra, I should say, um, a, an American composer. And let me just read this to you so that it's coherent and I can move on quickly. 
Uh, it's part of a series of research into the intellectual and creative legacy of American composer Sun Ra. I started making um, um, and uh, collecting in informal anecdotes from fans and individuals who had direct contact with Sun Ra, and several of these stories compelled me to try and find a way to make them somehow uh, more than a legend and more than folklore, uh, to somehow move uh, these stories into the realm of science uh, or materiality and make them eternal objects. Um, uh, the folklore attached to this particular object goes like this. A Sun Ra fan told me that he went to a concert of the orchestra, which is a really big, bombastic collection of uh, highly accomplished musicians who wear science fiction uh, Egyptian costumes and pr do processions and dance while they play. Um, and um, it was a great concert as usual, and he, being a musician, waited for them to clear the stage, and he climbed up on the stage to look at their sheet music. He's looking at John Gilmore, legendary saxophone player's charts. He's looking at Marshall Allen's charts. He makes his way back to Sun Ra, who's a keyboard player, to the pianos and the Moog, and where all the synthesizers are, to look at his charts. And the only thing on his sheet music is just this, those words scrawled, you are from outer space. <laughs> and to me, that's really pretty much summed up uh, everything about this particular artist, and uh, kind of like a, a signifier and invitation to any and everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's sort of a, a, a ecstatic declaration of uh, kind of radicality and mastery and a relentless cognitive estrangement, which is one of the things I want to talk to you in relationship to why I have to make things with my hands to understand them, make films to understand things, and um, <clears throat> and um, and kind of uh, use use cameras and lenses to as a as a way of uh, creating knowledge. Um, cognitive estrangement is this term initiated uh, by the pioneering <coughs> science fiction theory scholar Darko Suvin in his book The Metamorphosis of Science Fiction. And even though I'd already made films that had a uh, Afrofuturistic sort of, they fit into the category, films that use science, deploy science fiction, play with time, play with history, and deal with speculation. That's a, like a short explanation. And as I talk, that explanation will get more complicated. Um, Darko Suvin, um, in the 70s, before science fiction was academically valuable or cool in any way, um, really got into uh, some of the things that make science fiction what it is and helped, uh, helped readers understand what it does. Um, and this definition, the sense that something in the fictive world is dissonant with the reader's experience world, uh, he, um, Samuel Delaney, another science fiction writer, got at it really well. He talked about a, a, a simple Philip K. Dick novel, the first paragraph, where uh, a man is sleeping, he turns off his alarm, he gets up to go to the bathroom, and the door dilates. And just that sim simple, simple word, dilate, instead of opens, or slides open, or turns a knob, doors don't dilate in our world. And that estrangement is a signifier. Um, the, the, the distance between what you know and, and what's possible is what I'm really interested in. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to go forward and to talk about Afrofuturism, as a practice that's tied inextricably to the coded nature of being black, to the performance of style, lexical invention, and assimilation. And black consciousness involves the knowledge that the narratives which, re which reify mainstream cultures and myths are dissonant with one's mundane experience of the world. On a superficial or performative level, this dissonance may be achieved by shifts of time, place, and technological scenery. Uh, I think Afrofuturism and cognitive estrangement are so E easily aligned that I didn't even have to make up my own definition. I could just switch up, switch up. <laughs> so, um, and that I am going to play this clip of a piece that I made in 2010 called Remote Viewing. Um, hopefully the volume is yep, set up. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit while it plays because it takes some time. This piece isn't actually designed to be screened in a single channel theatrical environment. It was meant for uh, installations, which meant that you could walk in and see only this, or if you sat through the full 12 minutes, you could see an event, or if you came in at the end, you would see pretty much nothing going on. But um, here we go. Um, um, this film was made, I now understand that, that this film was made out of this uh, deep desire to resolve a condition of cognitive estrangement. 
I needed to reenact this gesture that I heard about in the hopes of reconciling or understanding the irrationality of the violence in the story. Um, the story was one that I heard on NPR, that NPR show uh, StoryCorps. Is everybody familiar with that? And um, where I live, it plays really early in the morning, and it's frequently my alarm comes on right when it's uh, um, playing, and so uh, frequently it'll get into my dreams, which I actually had to change my radio station because I would always wake up crying. Even if the story was happy, I'd cry. If the story's sad, I'm crying. And that's just not the way you want to wake up. So and it's been that, and that started with this story. Which is about a, um, a, uh, a Reverend Seawood uh, recounting ex something that he witnessed when he was a nine year old boy in Sheridan, Arkansas in 1959. Um, um, you have to understand um, American politics at this time. Uh, the federal government had mandated that all public schools be desegregated. And white America resisted this uh, by making their towns uninhabitable for African Americans. That's why you have so many migrations north into and uh, congestion in, in cities because of the sort of uh, smaller towns and regions um, um, were made uninhabitable, made dangerous, and made um, sort of not viable for black citizens. This was one of those towns. But the Reverend Seawood's mother was in charge of the schoolhouse, and she vowed that um, uh, she wouldn't leave or cl close down the schoolhouse until the last black family had left. When that happened, he, his story is unclear of this on this point because he was only nine years old, so the adult details he doesn't have, even as an adult now. But uh, she scooped him up, they got into her station wagon, drove to the schoolhouse, and she frantically started getting all of the ephemera she could out of the schoolhouse. And then they watched an excavator do this. So that's where I'll leave you the story. And is there a way to dim the lights all the way down while the, is it, is it possible? This is a movie, it should be dark. <laughs>
so there are some, um, in addition to sort of the starkness of this gesture and what it signifies um, for American history, oops, I am. Um, I, uh, as a, in the process of, of doing this reenactment, I learned some things about, one, how hard it is to dig a hole that's over 20 feet deep. Um, there aren't very many places uh, in urban centers where you can do that. Um, the second is that um, it, there would have been a lot of other ways to uh, erase this building than to bury it. Uh, so um, as we reenacted this piece, um, <coughs> Uh, I had I hired um like my I had a whole film crew and I hired um the art direction crew to build the schoolhouse and um uh, none of us were really prepared for our own reaction to watching a building vanish and go underground um and the art director just looked at me and he just said I, I just need a minute and he like went away for half an hour and disappeared because we literally spent a day and a half building this building that was just erased in 30 seconds. Um, there were some formal components that really uh, interested me. One was um, the way in which uh, digging that hole really was speaking to uh, an art movement of the l art movement of land art. Um, but uh, land, and I was struck, I was stricken with sort of the uh, complete lack of respect for land that so much land art actually has, and its histories, and um, sort of like what what it means to sort of like dig into the ground like that, which was not easy at all. Even though these are professional excavators, it's actually not only not easy, it's not safe, and um, it creates a lot of uh, environmental instability. Um, and also to uh, minimalism, I uh, erected that green screen because this isn't shared in Arkansas, it's San Diego, California, and I didn't want there to be any sort of um, um, idea that this was a document of an event. This is an, a re, uh, an interpretation or an enactment of an event. And um, initially, we, spec we, we thought what we would put images on that green screen, burn them in, but uh, we realized that it actually signified its, its emptiness and the fact that it, it a reference to a portal to another place was really important. And moreover, uh, it became sort of like the signifier for another art movement of uh, minimalism. But again, I was stricken with the sort of, um, sort of uh, rigor with which content is removed from minimal structures and how... Um, uh, <laughs> This piece fails in that way because it is so um, heavily laden with content. Um, uh, and um, so I'm going to go back to this idea of um, cognitive estrangement now um, by sharing you this little video that came up for me during my research on... Um, Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. It is a ring in pride of modern child psychology, maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live a well-adjusted <coughs> life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But if I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, that there are some things in our society and some things in our world which I am proud to be maladjusted. <clears throat> and I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the minute to give luxuries to the few, leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. Yeah, so everyone's heard the I Have a Dream speech, but I had never heard this speech. And this blew my mind. This is um, 1967, Dr. King's uh, Theological Constructs are Pressing Him Closer to a More Global Mission. Um, and um, poverty was it was it was becoming clear to him that that was actually the great unifying principle of the planet. And he was right then. He's still right about that. Um, and uh, this to me really linked in with uh, the artists that I'm, I'm interested in. Artists like Sun Ra, 
um, in that um, um, I, I can't really think of anything more maladjusted than declaring you're from the planet Saturn and wearing uh, Egyptian headdresses and um, playing experimental music on your Moog and um, insisting that your, your entire band do the same with you. Um, uh, let me see, how do I get to this next idea? Let's see. There you go. Where's my little mousey? Sorry. My screen over here is acting up. Okay, so I can do it this way. Way back. Okay. Here we go. Um, so, uh, I'm taking you to my neighborhood now. I'm going to talk about another piece that I did more recently, just last year. Um, I was in a residency at the Washington Park Arts Incubator in Chicago, which is a project that is spearheaded by a really tremendous artist named uh, Theaster Gates, who's taken the entire world by storm with his social practice, publicly engaged, performative artwork. Um, um, this map is of south side of Chicago. This is a very famous Olmsted design, um, Washington Park. You can see this side is really dense, right? Um, uh, that's Hyde Park, and it's the home of the University of Chicago, very, very well uh, respected, very expensive academic institution. Um, and uh, on this side is uh, the neighborhood of Washington Park, which is where some really notorious housing projects, like the Robert Taylor Homes and the Stateway projects, used to be, but they were torn down, and the residents of those structures were assured that the city was going to rebuild them more humane housing, but they never did. So what you see is uh, um, actually you can't see the empty lots of the stateway projects. But what happens when you e empty out a neighborhood of its population is that very little, everything else withers and dies as well. So there are empty lots everywhere because Chicago likes to demolish things. And, um, and uh, you can just see there are even like fewer trees. There's, fewer, there's less of everything over here. I live over here on this side. It's actually a lovely neighborhood. I really like the empty lots because uh, they... Um, they just offer a lot of natural space. This is the building that uh, um, my residency was in. It looks like a really nice building, but it's in the middle of a sort of an urban wasteland. And it's, a t it's, it's on the impoverished side of the park. On the affluent side of the park is this building, uh, this art center, which is a 10-foot tower shooting up off of the side of the Midway Plaisance, which sh goes towards the lake. It's the site of the 1893 World's Fair, this park. And um, it's the shining sort of um, center of art that the University of Chicago has built for itself. They uh, allowed a bunch of artists, five of us, to come into this uh, new building on the west side of the park, the poor side, to do art that engaged the community. And when we got there, I, I realized, and several of us realized, that we weren't really invited by the community. The university needed to expand and was using art as a soft power, and us as artists, to colonize this neighborhood. Uh, and I, I couldn't actually make myself uh, comply, so I found myself just sort of spending the spring and summer riding my bike around, collecting flowers out of the empty lots that just like basically are prairie land, and um, bird watching. Uh, you'll see this monk parakeet here, um, which are these migrant birds who, that became really central to my work and research and relate to me in a sort of abstract way with Sun Ra. <laughs> Um, in, in, the, in terms of the sound they make. These birds are from Argentina, monk parakeets. Um, and they were brought, the folklore is that they were brought to Chicago for uh, the World's Fair in 1893. They are not migrating birds. Um, so they escaped and they stayed and they survive and thrive in Chicago by building these incredible architectural structures for their nests. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, these, um, and they share these nests with uh, mammals like squirrels. Um, and to me, they became this really amazing metaphor for all the African Americans who had to migrate north and make their way in Chicago. Um, and the sound that they make, too, which is like incredibly shocking when they fly over you, uh, seemed um, relevant in that way, in ways that I can't really articulate. So I spent a lot of time picking these flowers and making tinctures and teas out of them and giving these crazy flower arrangements to anybody who would take them. And I ended up making two installations in two different sites. One um, in my studio, which was on the west side of the park, near the uh, empty lots and the former location of the projects. And the other on the east side in that tower you saw, the Logan Center. 
Um, this was in my studio, and this was sort of like a psychic space that was a collection of everything that I'd ever used to make anything while I was in this space, or in the time I'd been in Chicago, everything was reused. So you see these screens right here? Those are screens that I used to print these wallpapers um, that were hanging in the, the building on the other side, and were also uh, attached to the boarded up buildings surrounding my studio on the streets. The patterns are, no one would ever know this and it doesn't really matter, but the rubbings of the Sun Ra records that I have in my collection really could be any records, but they're not. They're Sun Ra records. It's another angle of the studio, another angle. Um, uh, this is a really ink, uh, unstable, I would say, uh, installation. I'm not actually convinced that it's doing everything it's supposed to do. What you see there is a, a digital photo mural um, of the Lake Michigan, and I made a series of videos where I um, tried to match the color of the sky or the water with paint samples as like a kind of really literal expression of a seeking out an interiority, of like a, trying to build a space inside of oneself for contemplation, um, given that the urban spaces can be so hostile. This sliver here um, is uh, also waste, really. Um, uh, back by the mural, that's glass, the greenish material, and it works as a gradient into this white plaster. The white plaster being shards used to build these little things that I'll show you later. This is a grotto of plants, all of the plants stolen from abandoned houses in the neighborhood. Um, the banners up above are um, the matches from whenever I uh, found a, a, a paint sample that would match the sky or the water. I would uh, save it and then a banner get got painted that color. So that's basically a sky, a bib of the sky and the water. Um, the, the room, this is like the, tea, I called this the tea garden, um, was used as a rehearsal space for when my fellow resident, Leroy, and he was giving kids in the neighborhood guitar lessons all the time. This is the other side of that screen, which is a basically a tokonomo box, which is a Japanese uh, box for contemplation. Um, and uh, how do I know this? I know this because my father is a bonsai master. This is where it gets weird, people. Um, I grew up in California. And so you see these little structures on the back wall. Um, those are based on suisekis, which is a Japanese art, 15th century Japanese art of rock gazing, also practiced by my father. And I didn't really knowingly set out during my residency to start doing things that my dad does in his backyard with his Japanese bros in California. But I, that's what I did. This is my dad's backyard. These are some of the rocks. They will go out hiking, he, him and his bros, and uh, pick up rocks. And then they bring them home and clean them off and make little platforms for them and stare at them. And that, he's been doing this ever since I was a kid. I never really paid any attention other than to make fun of him for doing it. Um, this is some of his bonsais. It's off season, so it's not really a picture he would brag about. But they're just always, they're just always sort of there, his bonsais and stuff. And um, I found myself riding my bike and ro rolling over like asphalt and potholes and construction sites and picking up the detritus and bringing it back to my studio and making these suiseki uh, plants for them. Um, and uh, you can recognize the shelf is um, street, street stuff. And that's the plaster. I really don't know anything about carving. It's not like I ever paid any attention to my dad when he was doing this. So I had to teach myself how to carve. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of tragic uh, mistakes that didn't survive, which is how I got that strip of triangle because all that stuff ended up becoming the sort of the rock garden of the installation. Um, that white fluffy material, sorry, is a, the one thing that's a one sheet but it's a part of a sort of this um, index that I have, these materials that I always use all the time for all anything I make and this one is ivory soap which um, if you, if you um, put ivory soap in the microwave it, it does that. Um, which to me it can look like a cloud, or it can look like a glacier, it can look like a, a mountain. And I, I just like the fact that it, all it requires is a little bit of pressure. It's kind of like a diamond, only inverted. Right? Um, and then the other site, this, they were installed at the same time and you could ride your bike or walk from one to the other. 
was this, another interior psychic space. This question of how do you make space inside of yourself um, that is actually inhabitable not just by yourself, a space inside of yourself that can be inhabited by others. There's like a question. It seems like it should be possible to make spaces inside of yourself that can be shared. That's kind of what music does, right? So I'm always trying to find ways to do what musicians do. I envy them, so this immediacy, this intimacy that they can create. Um, so this space is a, this inversion of the light and the nature and all things living and growing. Um, this, uh, this is a hand screen printed wallpaper. The design is the monk parakeets I told you about and disco balls and um, amplifier cables. Um, and um, on the floor is a nest, literally a nest of uh, disco balls. They're sitting in, in black fur and this one is on a turntable that's rotating at 33 and a third rotations per minute. And then there's another ball up here that's rotating at three rotations per minute. And uh, the number three is uh, another one of those indexical um, elements of my making system. I like threes, I like thirds, thirds and threes. And so um, that was a happy accident that the disco ball motor happens to turn at three rotations per minute and uh, turntables do what they do. But I don't think that's an accident. This is part of like what I learned from Sun Ra, is that these things are not accidents. There are certain numbers, and there are certain systems that are actually, they are, they're so consistent and eternal, they're sort of cosmic. And um, certain things work in thirds. They simply work, and they will not work any other way. Um, this is a really terrible photograph, but it gives you a better sense of what the pattern actually was. The thing about this installation is that when these things are spinning, there's a video projector bouncing a video onto them. Um, and that is producing all of the starlight that you see. And the starlight is moving. So it's as if, it's as if you're spinning on the planet really, really fast and watching the night sky like those, you know those... Um, Time lapse? Yes, thank you. Um, so you can just lay on the, ca the carpet, which is a shag carpet, by the way, so you really do want to lay on it. And um, there's music playing, and all of the music is from um, the 70s, up, uh, uh, like from the early to the late 70s, a lot of disco and folk, uh, folk soul and house music. House music was born in Chicago. Um, and I was thinking about a lot of things with this piece, but mainly I was thinking about um, protected spaces. Um, that are not so easy to access and then are completely, completely um, at once earthbound and timeless and cosmological. I hope that, I don't know if that makes sense. There's a lot of things that sometimes when I'm trying to talk about them, I realize that I made them because there isn't always a, a way for me to describe them other than in the making. Um, here's a little detail of the pattern. It's a terrible picture, I apologize. But you can see the drawing. Oops. Oh, what is going on? It's just going to town, isn't it? Is it just playing them themselves? All right, sorry. Um, so I want to tell you about another piece. Everybody okay? Am I going too slow, too fast? It's all right? Okay. Um, uh, this, this is another device. Just like the disco balls and the video projector, That to me, I think of that as a machine, a device. And what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to play music and it's supposed to make the cosmos in your room. This is a device that's supposed to play a video and it's supposed to make a rainbow. Now the rainbow is incredibly underwhelming. In fact, I would even go so far as to say it's pathetic. Um, and there's something really, that's important to me that, like you can see how I'm making this, this phenomenological event, the rainbow. You can see that I'm using, uh, where can you see it? There's the video playing there. Let's see what you see. There's a lot of Oh, sorry. I have to go back. I'm sorry. You can see that I'm using this um, C-stand and a box for the projector, and there's just speakers down on the floor. And um, uh, it's really, there's no mystery as to how this, this, uh, this device works and what it does. And the point, though, is that it does make a rainbow, and that rainbows are something that can be made, which everybody knows. But uh, it's actually worth making them, is sort of my point. So when you go in this room, it's supposed to be pleasurable. There's music playing. There's five different versions of the song Over the Rainbow, which um, apparently was a song that Sun Ra really loved to play. When I was in his audio archives, there were many, many different recordings of him, solo piano just playing Over the Rainbow masterfully, just absolutely incredible interpretations. Um, 
I should talk about improvisation now before I lose. Um, uh, and this is something that I actually started to understand about improvisation. I was talking about it earlier today, which is probably why it didn't come up quite so as readily um, in the talk. But um, um, improvisation is a really important component to me. It's something that I recognize in music as something that um, jazz, African American, this African American art form, jazz, has has completely um, revealed to be a signifier of a certain kind of mastery. So normally in our language, when we say something is improvised, we mean that it's insufficient, that it's ad hoc, that it is not um, as good as it could be. But um, what jazz proves is that um, in order to improvise, you have to have complete and total mastery in order to succeed. Um, and I really, really am interested in this, this idea that you can know, know your materials or your instrument or your tools so well that you do not need a plan in order to, to um, in space and time, create something that is like exchangeable and legible and viable as something that, is, that can be considered, something to talk about, something meaningful, something that offers an experience. Sun Ra <laughs> was doing this constantly, even in the way that he created a life for himself, which he lived communally with his orchestra, um, uh, and, and, and the way in which he almost until the day he died refused to admit that he was born in Birmingham, Alabama and not from the planet Saturn. Um, this um, um, complete uh, dedication to the construction of a, a cosmology and a narrative that um, offered an alternative and offered an extension of and a deepening of our sense of ourselves is really interesting to me. What you're looking at now, disco balls, as you can probably guess by now or another, one of these indexes, things I use all the time. Um, <clears throat> this is a, another, what I call these installations are space stations. They're just like, um, uh, you know, when they build a space station, they have to build them in these things called Lagrange points. They're like these little dips in the time space-time fabric where things get stuck. So you don't have to tether it. It just stays in this bow of gravity. Is that is that cool or what? That's just like, what? That is amazing. So astrophysicists find these bows and bows in the gravity, and then they build the space station there, and it stays there. You can just... Blows my mind. So just that, that like every time I meet an astrophysicist, I'm like, talk to me about the Lagrange points, and it's really boring for them. They're like, oh, you know, I said this thing, blah, blah, blah. and I can't, I can't get enough. Every, if, if, if is anybody here a physicist? Anybody want to talk about it? Because I, I just like can't get enough of this idea. I can't get enough of it. So um, this space station um, is about rainbow, sun Ra and rainbows, and um, discovering this um, signification of the rainbow through alchemy. Uh, Egyptian um, hieroglyphs. Um, Sun Ra was always wearing them. And then, of course, the Gay Pride, gay pride Parade, which um, uh, I don't know if you guys know this about the Gay Pride flag, but it's missing two of its colors, lavender and pink. Uh, the colors that so each color signifies a value. Um, and um, lavender is the color for magic, and pink was the color for sex. So their flag is missing. Two qualities that I think maybe they should consider putting back into the flag, but, you know, well, who's listening to me? So Maya Research, that's this uh, group that Sun Ra in Chicago formed while he was there. It was a study group. It was a group of autodidacts, self-taught individuals, who uh, were determined to um, um, reinsert the African presence into history. Um, so they would go to primary sources, and like any book, and any source of knowledge, was fair game for them. So uh, uh, um, they didn't have a level that this kind of book was more important than this kind of book. So they had this amazing collection of 15,000 volumes, everything from comic books and pulp novels to original sort of first, uh, first edition text to the um, um, for Freemasons encyclopedia, which is this crazy encyclopedia of all things. All, all things Freemason. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing book, um, which points to all kinds of histories and reveals some intricacies of American mythology that I wasn't even aware of. Um, uh, and these were all people sort of teaching themselves how to learn and how to re-understand their history. So they've become a bit of a model for me. Uh, this is another um, one of those archaeological attempts at an archaeological veracity. This is called the Recording Studio. Uh, it's built out of bike boxes and duct tape. 
Um, the first time I built it, the inside was lined with plaster, and that was my way of making it an eternal object, you know, because plaster shards, you can find them forever. This one I built in Leipzig just a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't include the plaster because I was already in it. It's a space, uh, a place that was already so ancient that um, there was something incredibly iconoclastic just about the duct tape and the cardboard, and it was really disturbing to people that these would be my materials, and that when this is done, this must, this goes into the dumpster. So what is the story behind this? Um, this is another story that a, a musician who's now an elder in the Chicago improv scene, um, but when he was a young man in Chicago, he was called to record with Alton Abraham, who was Sun Ra's business manager. He was told to meet um, Alton at the local YMCA in the gym, which is a weird place to record music. You can imagine the acoustics. So he um, shows up, and Alton Abraham is in the gym building a ring of cardboard boxes and strapping them together with duct tape. And then he um, built this huge ring, and then he plopped the microphone into the middle of the ring, and he had all these saxophone players play into that single mic, and that's what he recorded. The recording has been, apparently it's been lost, or we're still looking for it. Um, but to me, the moment he was described this recording session, I was like, that, that, is a, that would be a beautiful object. That would be a really amazing object. That's a sculpture. So I, I just had to build it. I had to see it. And when I couldn't believe that you would actually take the time to pay musicians to come and record at the YMCA gym inside of a ring of cardboard boxes. That was fascinating to me. And, and um, Edward, the musician, he... That's weird. I don't really know why that's like that. I apologize. It's, a, it's supposed to be a detail. Um, he... Um, he said that Alton was really interested in that, the, the acoustic quality that would occur there. Um, I love these legends. I feel like they signify a certain kind of ingenuity and improvisation, not just with sound, but with materials that is really valuable to me. I'm going to play you one more film to clo kind of close the circuit on, it, um, on this idea of cognitive estrangement. Now, I'm going to play you two more films, this one and one more, so I'll stop talking. Oops, hang on. Oops. I'm sorry. I got to turn the volume all the way up on this one.
film in 1998, um, and that was before I stumbled on this term Afrofuturism, which is coined a, a term that this um, cultural writer Mark Derry uh, coined when he was talking about three sort of um, icons of Afrofuturism. He was identifying this tendency of African American musicians to invoke the cosmos um, and to um, sort of um, reinvent histories. And he was talking about Sun Ra and George Clinton with Parliament and Funkadelic and Lee Scratch uh, Perry, who's sort of the inventor of dub, uh, dub reggae, um, which is a completely sort of abstract <laughs> way of using ele electronic equipment and making sound and experiencing it. Um, uh, and um, when he started to sort of breaking down their tactics and their strategies of um, Ref the way in which they reference history, the way in which they use materials inappropriately or in the wrong way, um, um, their early ad ad adoption of technology, uh, while at the same time being really deeply rooted in like a sort of traditional African American folk aesthetic and um, aesthetic practice, I, w I, I was like, oh, that's, that's what I've been doing. Um, and I was just really grateful for the term. Um, uh, now I'm going to bring us back up to the present to uh, these group of, this group of young people, the Rich South High School Marching Band of South Chicago. This was our last uh, performance. Let's see, here's another picture. Um, this band, I scoured the city of Chicago looking for a marching band to collaborate with me. One of my very first ideas when I really started uh, um, researching Sun Ra um, uh, and it, I, I was convinced it was a bad idea, and it probably was. It's one of those ideas that's so bad that it turned out to be great. Which is, I thought that it would be really cool to have a marching band sort of do these flash mobs where they just descend into a site in the city and play a Sun Ra song and then scatter. And um, I thought that I would have to build the band myself from scratch and enlist all the musicians. And then I realized that Chicago bands um, high school bands are legend. They are those rocking, rocking bands where everybody, the tubas and the cymbals, everybody's dancing in unison and they play like pop songs like Prince and Alicia Keys along with like marching band standards and as you can see, they're fabulous. Um, so um, I found this band and the band director who actually knew who Sun Ra was, thought it would be great for his kids to learn who Sun Ra was and, and um, and allowed me to hire them. I kind of commissioned, I commissioned the, the performances. And we did uh, five of them. The one I'm going to show you is the very first one. Um, and this was sort of the beginning of this entire sort of journey. <laughs>
such incredible kind of formal rigor mm -hmm. and um, given that it was such an emotionally laden scene and yet the coolness of the formal formality mm -hmm. which I, I, I think breaks the emotional um, feeling of the two. and then the, and the last one too it had, had it was so informal in a certain way except for that the, the colors were so clear and bright mm -hmm. um, I guess well, what I really want to hear, though, is you break down um, Afrofuturism a little bit, a little bit more, in terms of you know maybe talking about those two films, but also your personal stake in it, because you, you've it, you've suggested that you've really made a personal connection to this term, has given you a kind of direction, a kind of sense of oh, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, well, I, I choose the, the way I use the camera changes depending on what I'm making, depending on what the goal is. Um, the sort of, um, that uh, way, like what you're referring to as like the formal style of remote viewing, that sort of, um, <laughs> I, I call that European film language, um, when you like, um, when the camera is really um, rigid and um, sits and, and makes you wait for a long time. I associate that with um, um, Western um, film art, like durational stuff that's all about like uh, somehow, um, um, like the, the duration is a signifier in and of itself. And I, I wanted uh, that kind of um, harshness, I think of that as a really kind of harsh style. And I wanted that, and not very generous, and I wanted that sort of rigidity because I, I didn't want there to be any um, um, anything mediating like having to endure what you were watching. I didn't want there to be any sort of interference from my the presence of uh, us, the witnesses there, that, that that kind of camera that sits kind of objectively and coolly back makes you the witness and that's like what it's really good at I think. Um, and makes you actually have to really endure and en endure what you're watching. Um, um, and whereas the um, the last video, that sort of verite style of um, using the camera, is one where I basically had to um, accept the conditions that we had given ourselves, which was that we were simply making an event occur. And the cameras were just as much of a part of the flash mob as the musicians and the sound operators. And we were all there with relatively little, well, with no real actual permission. There were, I made overtures, but no one returned my call, so I just figured it was okay to go. But, um, so we were literally doing a flash mob in the sense that this was something that was an, an invasion into the space. And so all of us, all of us, the cameras, the sound people, we all had to converge, sort of expand and fill the space and then leave the space together. So the camera people were uh, strategically staked to um, make sure that they could do that job. You know, it's like really difficult to film publicly anymore because of Homeland Security laws and even this small business organization was really paranoid about, um, I didn't know this until afterwards, paranoid about people taking photographs of the structures, what if you want to blow it up, and this kind of thing. And so all of it has to do, just be right, uh, the cameras are always sort of inside of the action because we had to, that's how we had to function as one singular unit. A ver and the, and uh, that's like a classical verite kind of way of using a camera. Yeah, um, oh, okay. I was wondering about in the classroom, the weather, I mean, I guess, that you probably said a day and just have to be ready. 
but um, so I guess was your intention to have people be seeing this event taking place or to the fact that it was spontaneously happening because the weather is altering the amount of people who are going to be seeing it so I was wondering if like by having it on this changing it to be on the sunnier day would that change your, the intention of your I'm sure it would have. I mean, I don't have any control over the weather. If you do, then I will pay you to control the weather for me, but I don't have any control over that. I'm sure a sunny day would have yielded a completely different film. This was the day we did it. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that term, cultural, uh, not cultural, um, cognitive estrangement. If it's only been used to connect the science fiction, it seems like a really great term for all kinds of other art that's happening. Is that the? I mean, I just it's, I've never heard it. Those uh, together like that. I don't know. I, I I'm assuming that the Dr. Susan, the scholar who yes. found the term, found it probably in like um, psychological sort yeah. of um, discourse that's not dissimilar to cognitive dissonance. Right. Right. Um, um, which uh, is a slightly different estrangement is when you know that what you're experiencing is different from what like what the agreed upon experience is, and dissonance is something else like a, a, a discomfort um, with the experience. You know, if that makes sense. So it's sort of like um, yeah. So I'm assuming he got uh, like it's the same with the Martin Luther King using the term maladjusted. He's appropriating a psychological term for. For a social activism, I think I'm assuming that the term was appropriated. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm really inspired by just all the sort of multi-layeredness of your practice as a whole, and the way you're bringing so many different things into it. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the differences between engaging viewers with medium of film versus installation. Mm, that's a tough question. Thank you. Um, differences of engaging viewers through film versus installation. And when, you know, perhaps like maybe when you choose to, to make a film that goes into a gallery setting versus a, um, you know, oh. a screening environment, but also, you know, your sculptural installations as connected to that too. Right. Yeah. Um, I do, I am. I, I'm one of those people that doesn't like to watch videos in a museum or in a gallery because I don't have time. Usually the day you have to spend watching, looking at art, you don't have, you know, some of, like, you, like the 15 minutes it takes to watch that entire marching band piece, who really has that? And if they have it, who's really going to spend it on my video? I have no expectation of, of, of that. And I also, um, without really considering whether or not it's right or not or good or not, I just made a decision that I didn't want to, I didn't want to make spectators feel as if they were missing something. I wanted to create a work that could exist in a public space, a space where people can come and go, where they know that they can come and go. That actually moving through the space is a part of the experience, even if there's a time-based work there. So like with remote viewing, it, the length of it ensures that someone who only has 15 seconds, they're only going to see maybe the green screen, and that is it. They're not going to even see the excavators. They're going to think that it's a 20 minute film of this green screen. Um, however, within the context of the other things that you would have to encounter as a spectator, I'm, I'm hoping that there would be a way to glean uh, a larger narrative or a broader space. So that there are always other cues. Like that film doesn't ever play alone, it plays with another film, which would also have a similar sort of um, formal style and tone, but will be in a different point so that it indicates that there might be something in the, you know what I mean, that the films are speaking to each other. So I think about that a lot. I think about not wanting to hold um, spectators hostage, not wanting to feel, and, and, but also that means that when they go into a space to see the film, that I, I try to have control over how, how that space exists. So um, that the pathetic rainbow maker object, that's like part of a, 
um, a series of chambers that leads to a room where you watch videos. So you would encounter that first, and then you would move through this mirror maze, which I didn't even show you. I could like pull up the files, but like a literal, it's called an infinity vortex. It's literally a giant room full of mirrors that's dark that you have to work your way through. And you can hear the sound that there's something on the other side, which is a room uh, in which there's 14 like short, short, short films playing. And the films are short. Instead of one 78 minute long film, they're between two and 10 minutes long. Um, so I observe people, and it worked. It actually worked. So it kind of worked the way I wanted it, where people know they can hear. They can hear sound. So like they're, they get stuck in the vortex and take a lot of pictures of themselves and goof around. But then they know that there's something on the other side, and they'll go in there, and then there's seating. So I'm like, you know, it's it's in it's it's um, designed to acknowledge that it's time based. So I don't make people stand up and watch my films ever if I can help it. There's always carpet on the floor, those kinds of things, and those things are actually things. And I'm always amazed that you go to an art space and you're actually supposed to stand up for 25 minutes and walk as if, as if. You know what I mean? It's just not going to happen. And so um, I'm, the, I'm trying to actually acknowledge that this is what we're doing. We're going and looking at art. It's not as if this art <laughs> exists outside of space and time. This art is about our space and our time. You know what I mean? It does, you know what I'm saying? So I think about it a lot. Like the last piece I think of that is a single channel piece. Like I really want people to watch it because there's a lot, uh, the duration, it, like your relationship to, like first they were kind of a mass and then, and then they become this amazing mass and then you start to recognize their, their autonomy, like they're in, within it. So you need a lot of time to understand what they're doing and that they are actually gonna do this in the rain. You, know, you, need, you need time, I think, with that piece for that. Um, you mentioned something in the uh, installation you did on the west side versus the um, the one that was in the college, and you mentioned that you were trying to pick out the colors with color swatches uh, from the sky. The and the light. Yeah. That actually was I'm not sure if you knew this or not. Was a very popular little. I almost want to call it a meme. It was something you would do. You would take a picture and you would like, um, using like a, uh, just generally digital, you would like pick out the color with um, the eyedropper. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became so popular, people were starting to get irritated for quite a while, like about two years. But how would you use it? Like, they won't It was just it. something pretty that you did. It was like you had the picture and then you had the three or four or five colors. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it, they're actually really pretty. Um, I, I, I caught on at the tail end like about a year ago where people were like, ugh. And I was like, but pretty. I didn't know that. So that people would take a picture like of themselves and then sample well, the colors? Well, like, like sometimes they would take stills from movies and some, sometimes they take pictures like obviously that they didn't take. <laughs> and then make a color palette out of it. Yeah, I make a color palette. Like if you Google that, you'll probably, like, you'll probably pull up like 50 million of them. That's weird because I Google a lot and I've never stumbled on that, so that's cool. That's going to send me down a whole new rabbit hole. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, try Tumblr. You will never come out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask about the title of the talk, which I know was not really what you were ending up doing, but the craft research and improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to ask about the research part mm -hmm. and what part research plays in your process if you think of your studio work as research or if you're doing um, subject-based research or where that enters into your process? Uh, on the, on the really, on the most fundamental level, I have to do research just to um, figure out if what I'm saying of, is of interest. If there's already a conversation about what I'm thinking about or at, curious about, if that conversation already exists, I want to know about it. Um, um, and I want to know if there's whether or not my contribution to that conversation needs to happen. A lot, you have a lot of ideas, and a lot of times, you know, they don't need to happen. And a little, like, on a fundamental level, research enables me to understand what kind of conversation I might be getting into with this interest, with this particular curiosity. The other thing is research in terms of information. Like, if I uh, buy a book about, um, 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 uh, the history of the Moog, 
Sun Ra may not be interest may not be mentioned in that book, even though he was the first jazz musician to play the Moog. The, the omission of African Americans in almost all sort of mainstream general histories is shocking, and therefore it requires a lot. If I'm interested in the Moog um, and I want to know who played it, I have to actually go to a record store and ask the ask the start there. So research is always sort of like, oh, start at the record store and then go to the library. Start at the um, at the hideout, which is a local bar where a lot of musicians like to work stuff out, and ask them, and then go to the library um, because the history, kind of like what Sun Ra and his autodidact friends was doing, the history is not really there. I, and even if it is there, I I'm I'm predisposed to distrust what I read, and um, I take a lot of pleasure in the same way that Sun Ra did in um, undermining these sort of um, histories, uh, finding any and everything. And even if that means making stuff up, um, speculating, basically. The speculation is really about, and this is where science fiction comes in, the speculation is about um, imagining what is possible based on what we know. It's not just about sort of an invention, and this is the difference say between um, swords and sorcery genre and science fiction. Swords and for sorcery is like, if I go like this and a dragon appears, no one needs to know how that happened. It's just some magical power. But in science fiction, if I go like this and a dragon appears, there's some nanodana that's like coming out of my body and like pulling energy from that. There is a scientific explanation, a material explanation for what that is. And I need to know what it is. I need to know what's possible. So I have to do a lot of research like reading about like, you know, it's a lot of stuff's already going on. Like I'm, I'm really, I'm really, I'm looking forward to when your cell phone is just in your body so I don't worry about losing it. I just want it in my body. And you can do that right now, but uh, it's going to be a few years before it's like in your molar. You have to remember to take your medication. Your molar is just going to like make it, the nanobots is going to make it and shoot it into your bloodstream directly. You don't have to worry. This is the future. Like I'm, I think this is stuff you can read about now. People walking around with this tech in them and I'm interested in that. And that's how you can then, you can imagine it. You can imagine your future, you can imagine your present differently. If, so, does that make sense? Okay. Are we done? Is it time to? <laughs> Do you? I, I have a question about the, uh, your sort of connection with, with, with the idea of the set in terms of film, but also in terms of the sculptural installations. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in some ways, too, the way that you were talking about you know, that cardboard um, amphitheater or recording studio and how we were like, oh, it's going to go in the dumpster and after the show comes down. I wonder about that. And then I, when you were talking about your dad and his sort of loving care of these objects. Rocks. Yeah, like... <laughs> and the trees. <laughs> but, the, but the, you know, like how you see that because like, we saw that schoolhouse you know tumble into and that was, a, it was like such a violent act you know as well as sort of thinking about this beautiful band coming together and then in some way going away is that I mean, is it just entropy of, of create of your own process there is like four questions in that question. <laughs> One question I can't answer is um, about sets. And I do think of installations as film sets. And I'm always frustrated that I don't have time to film in them. The only thing I've managed to do is like the recording studio. Um, and I need to do this before I run out of money. I have a little grant to do this, um, which is to press a record of the musicians who have performed in it. But that's one of the ways that it gets activated is that um, Musicians, I build it and then I invite people to improvise and play inside of it, and that gets recorded. So now I have about I have four sets that have been done: two in Chicago and two in Germany, and so it's enough to press a little, maybe a ten-inch um, record. Um, but uh, I, but the thing I don't do, like when they're performing, is I don't videotape. I don't film the performance. I just audio tape it, which I always regret. But there's a I can't, I mean, it's, a re it's not that kind of recording studio. So there's a certain kind of, that kind of archaeological veracity. This is what the thing, it would be, if a, it would be like if an archaeologist found, a, I don't know, um, a spoon and then said it was an earring. Like, I just can't do something else with the thing than, does that, does that make sense? Uh, 
And then the other question is about the entropy of how these things bleed into one another. That's kind of what I, that's what I guess the portion of improvisation that I'm, I got really um, tired of making films uh, because it's sort of like trying to make something with um, captures mitts on. Like you can never, like the way I was trying to make films is, well, I was trained a lot of different ways, but um, through your crew, your collaborators, your vision is so, um, and I actually enjoy that process, but it's really, one, it's really depleting, and two, it's really expensive, and three, it is imprecise. Um, um, and, and it's too easy to blame others when the thing fails. You know what I mean? And I, I just got really tired of the imprecision and the lack of tactility, uh, like of having to work through my very talented, gifted, hardworking crewmates, you know what I mean? Um, and so I um, tried to figure out how to make films the way musicians can make music. And what I realized is they practice all the time alone, all the time alone. And then they meet another musician and they start playing together. And that's like 5% of what they do to be able to do that, to have that moment. And I realized that filmmakers don't get to do that because it's too expensive. So it was like a way of, um, um, thinking about how to make this work so that it's a way of learning and practicing. So uh, the films are short now. Um, they're very directed. Like they, I choose a very specific style and I just push it as far as I can. I don't shoot anything extra. I'm not experimenting. I'm trying to like make the film with a certain kind of um, discipline to teach myself so that hopefully I'll just get really good at, at that. Does that make sense? But I feel like I'm starting over, like how to make a film. You know what I mean? Did I answer your question? All of them. Okay. Yeah, Amy Summer didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay. I was just hoping to hear a bit more about the white suit piece. Uh, um, maybe like how you were relating to the actor, how you directing him. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was actually the film has actually never really been done. It was shot on sixteen millimeter and edited pre digital, so um, with actual film that you cut and glue, paste and tape together. Um, and it was an exercise for a class. Um, and um, it was one of those exercises, like you make a lot of work when you're a student, and most of it is, um, uh, well, like 10 years later, you don't want to show anybody. I, you know what I mean? Like I have some films that are in circulation that I cringe. Like I cringe, it's excruciating to have them play. But, they, but with films, you make so little work, it's so expensive that it all is like, you know, it all plays, but uh, so this was an exercise, and it was not even, it was a day of shooting, it was a, a couple of days of editing, and um, all the sound that I recorded to go with his gestures bored me. Um, I started playing with sound libraries and realized that I felt like, I felt like this union, the, the estrangement between the, their, his body and the sounds was building a new, like a third, a third idea. So I, and um, and I, it was just for me an important lesson that that exercise taught me something that I I do now. You can hear the weird sound in all my films now that it came out of that idea. Um, yeah, and the the actor is uh, was my boyfriend at the time, and so I could boss him around. He was pretty pliable, um, and he got to wear his favorite suit all day. So that, that I had only a day that it was really like okay, but just today. Because, you know what I mean, like with your friends, they're constantly in your stuff, and it's to the point where they like, won't call you back because they're afraid they're going to be in your, in your film. So <laughs> I made a deal just today. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah, apologies, because obviously we should be finishing. But I, I thought, I don't, I don't know if there's a question here, but perhaps more of a commentary. I'm really, obviously, very fascinated by uh, your, your sort of focusing on, on this cognitive estrangement mm. um, uh, strategy, which I see as a, uh, as a very um, uh, intentional and, and aggressive, in, in the best sense of the word, mm. right? a desire to sort of reshuffle signifiers mm. right? so that, that whatever we conceive to be history or to be truth, for that matter, right? Mm. Uh, get, gets sort of destabilized, perhaps mm -hmm. enough, so mm -hmm. that in, in that blink we can sort of reorder things in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is really so so interesting, so so smart. Um, uh, 
uh, the, 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 the subject, if, if you will, the subject as audience um, gets disoriented and in that exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's also thinking a little bit, if, and I don't know if you, if you think that this is a valid um, crossover, but I thought as you were talking of the work of, um, of uh, Sharon Hayes mm -hmm. and some of her public performances, mm -hmm. like I Am a Man or those mm -hmm. love letters, but do you, do you see any relationship there? I do in the sense that I think we're both interested in uh, love, <laughs> to put it simply, you know what I mean? Like, I was thinking about what you are saying about God and Strange and why I'm interested in that, and I was thinking about, well, it's really about the experience of being black, where your experience, the way that you move through the world, is not necessarily going to be shared by people who don't look like you. Like I was thinking about, um, and the way in which, so um, how do you make that, that estrangement, how do you make that productive? How do you make that useful? How can you express that in a way so that someone else does actually have to have the same sort of like uh, unstable relationship to, continuous relationship to their reality that you always do? Um, I was thinking about Ferguson um, and that kid who was killed by the cop and I was seeing that the cop was clearly afraid for his life, but why? It's an 18-year-old boy, and I would bet you that that boy never for a minute thought that that cop would murder him, because he didn't do anything wrong. So why would anybody shoot him? Like, you know, I, mean? I was like, talk about cognitive estrangement. Like, the policeman is having this hysterical experience where he begins an altercation with a child and then believes that the only way to resolve that altercation is to take that child's life. And the child is thinking, this man is crazy, and he's stupid, but really, come on, man. He's probably talking a lot of trash. He probably is pushing back, because it's like, what? We're talking about walking in the middle of the street. So what kind of cognitive estrangement would you experience if you were walking down the middle of the street and someone actually aggressively came at you and told you not to do it? You would think they were, they were, they were bonkers. But the bonkers one had the gun. So I think about like the complete, the, the way, like what, what can be done about something like that? I don't think policies or anything is going to do something about that. How do you make a grown man with a gun not use it on a child? Like what do you have to do to his experience of himself and others that would make him vulnerable enough to consider that he doesn't have to kill this kid? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so I think about it, like th those are the actual stakes for me, like when I make images of like high school kids behaving really militar militaristically, but then playing space is the, the place. It's about destabilizing people's assumptions about pretty much everything in that, in that space. Chinatown, black kids, military, spaces, of, everything is being misused and misapplied to create like a, a sense of disorientation. I don't know what else to do. Like when I hear about things like an 18 year old boy being murdered by a grown man with a gun who's supposed to be serving and protecting, I actually don't know what else to do but make goofy videos. I just, and like try, maybe someone can like see something or experience something that teaches them that what they think they know isn't what they know. Like I don't even know what I know. So, does that make sense?